Hi, this is Tracy Tocajama Espinosa. I'm talking to you from um, Quito, Ecuador, from the Universidad de San Francisco de Quito. Um, thanks for having me back. This is the um, Harvard course in Psychology 1609 related to mind, brain, health, and education. Today we're going to be looking at emotions and decision making. Um, and basically, this is something that's been around for quite a long time. We know that even back to Aristotle, um, there was some wonderful advice about how to manage emotions. Anyone can get mad, this is simple. But getting mad at the right person in the right degree, at the most opportune moment, with the correct goal in mind, that certainly is not easy. We know that being able to not only um, identify emotions but actually manage them is actually key to um, social interactions and as humans are social creatures this is actually fundamental to not only survival but quality of life so what we want to try to look at today are six points um, the main one is we're going to look at some definitions try to understand what we mean by emotions and how that's kind of different from feelings for example uh, then this big idea that there is no emotion I'm sorry there's no decision without emotions going to connect that then to some um, classic theories of, uh, of emotion and understanding some more modern ideas about emotional intelligence and how that can be cultivated. And we're going to look very briefly at some mechanisms in the brain, the physiological networks of emotional processing as well as neurotransmitters in brief. Um, and then we're going to link back to this whole idea of social cognition. What does this mean, being able to manage emotions well as far as um, connecting to our real wor world or, 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 or to society? And then actually looking at some real life applications. How can we cultivate better um, emotional intelligence or better management of emotions um, to be more successful in daily life? Okay? So basically starting with the definitions, um, emotions is really kind of a, a cool word, you know, I love, I love uh, uh, roots of words. Um, emotion has to do with motion, right? So basically the term emotion means um, to impul uh, an impulse that induces, induces action. So E meaning forward or, or trying to push something or, or, or um, to begin something towards a movement, towards an action. So we talked a lot about, um, I guess last week there was some great discussion in Dr. Reddy's class about the um, the importance of movement, um, human movement and the brain and development. So I'd like you to connect these ideas now that emotion actually has to do with the things that move us, that push us um, to actually take actions, okay? Um, but a key idea here, at least for this class, I hope it's clear, is that um, emotions are not the same thing as feelings. And I'm going to be using as a point of reference um, my conceptual framework would have to do with Antonio Damasio's work, who's just been a, a, a brilliant researcher in this area for um, decades. And he basically makes this uh, very, very um, clear distinction between emotions and feelings by basically classifying or stating that emotions are what the body does and feelings are what the mind does. So emotions, your quick heart rate or whatever, um, can make you feel that you are stressed, but that doesn't mean that it always has to be that way. Um, so being able to identify the physical and then understanding that it's really the mind that's interpreting that physical, okay? So we're going to look at that in, in a lot more detail in just a second. Um, but basically he's saying that a feeling is a mental representation of the state of the body. So I basically am conditioned um, into understanding that when my heart beats really fast and I start to uh, need to breathe really quickly, that that is like a panic, a sense of panic, okay? However, and, to, and Damasio goes further to basically say that, you know, you can't, you will never be able to get away from the emotions. That is what your brain is triggering your body to, to, to sense, okay, how, you, how you're going to be reacting in a bodily way, but you can actually change the way you feel about that emotion that you're experiencing. So emotions are a reaction to the external stimuli or to feelings themselves. Now here's the strange thing. This means that, um, this is kind of I, I, ironic thing, I mean, something that's very counterintuitive, you would never think this, but if I were to ask you, do you smile because you're happy or are you happy because you smile? Most of us would sort of jump to the conclusion that, well, smiling is a reaction to, to that feeling, okay? 
However, Damasio is pointing out to us that we can actually make ourselves feel something by using a feeling as the stimulus, okay? So uh, if I smile, I can actually make myself feel better. And this is actually true. We know that people, um, you do smile as a reaction to, to feeling happy, but you can make yourself happier by just actually smiling. So, okay. Um, another thing that's very important to, to have, just to put this into kind of a general context, we know that Darwin, you know, looked at, uh, tried to understand if there were emotions um, that were distinct between animals and humans. Uh, Thorndike, uh, when we tried, when he began looking at what types of ways uh, we could, or parameters we could use to determine intelligence, um, we, we included emotions there. In the Wester test, there's actually these uh, non-intelligence factors, which are very important in that test, including emotional stability. And Lerner actually used or coined the term emotional intelligence. Um, Gardner has never, you know, included emotional intelligence in his, in his list, though he does, you know, respect that they exist, but he never included them there. Um, in 85, there was a first doctoral thesis on um, emotional intelligence. Um, Greenspan um, tried to offer kind of a, um, a straightforward model back in 89 about emotional intelligence. And then just starting um, with Salovey and Meyer, or Meyer and Salovey, uh, we basically have better measurement tools. So if you actually wanted to uh, measure emotional competency, um, this was some great work that they, they did. Um, the most popular view <coughs> of emotional intelligence comes from Daniel Goleman, which many of you have probably heard and, and most likely read, one of the best-selling books on the topic. Um, and the Baron test um, gives actually a, a quite even further details, um, take some of the information that Goldman had and that Salovey had and basically uh, made this a bit deeper by by disaggregating the, the components a bit more. So he actually, uh, they actually have developed a great um, measurement tool for, for emotional intelligence. Um, okay, so those are definitions and that's a quick historical review. Now let's look at this connection now between emotions and decision making. Big question, true or false? Reasoning and decision making can be divorced from emotions, and in doing so, uh, people make better decisions. Is it better, you know, to have a cool head, uh, be rational, um, and you can make better decisions? Well, we might like to think that, but uh, the bottom line is that that's impossible. It's basically impossible. Um, reasoning and decision making are completely connected to feelings and emotions. We know that emotions are just critical um, in decision making and this has to do with more of the physiology, how things enter the brain um, and where the first stops are. The first stops are an emotional check and then there's a rational check. So no matter how hard you'd like to believe or how much you'd like to believe that yes I'm being rational and calm and, and everything, uh, it's actually impossible to do this. So you might be able to override some feelings. It takes a whole lot of training. Um, for example, we know that uh, Navy SEALs can be trained not to go into this normal panic feeling when they're without water, you know, when, I mean, sorry, when, without, when they're without oxygen underwater. Um, they can be trained to maintain a cool head and sort of get themselves out of these situations. But this takes years of training, you know, so to override your normal reaction, which you're your, your your instinct would be to react to a certain emotion that's incredibly difficult and how do we do this I mean or, or why would this be be true that you can't make a decision without an emotion basically again Aristotle how do you know how do you learn anything in the world how do you know your world you learn, you know your world through your senses right you receive information and even memory of your senses can can trigger emotions and, and trigger feelings right what happens? Basically, um, the sensory you know, network, it goes up through your spinal cord, and literally the first stop is in the amygdala. Basically, uh, this is why you might see um, a branch on the, you know, walking through the forest, and you see a branch, and you jump. Why? Because the, the first stop is the amygdala, and you're saying to yourself, hi, is this something I should be worried about? And the amygdala says, oh yeah, that looks like a snake. Jump, jump. But then less than a split second later, it goes, there's a, the transmission of the signal goes to the frontal lobes and then back for a double check to the hippocampus. And basically, 
hippocampus, is that really a snake or is that just a branch? And the hippocampus says, no, silly, that's just a branch, calm down. Which is kind of why, um, this is why you can walk, jump, be startled, and settle yourself in a split second, right? Um, because the transmission of that signal is first going to stop in the amygdala because the amygdala's job is to protect the body. It's to protect, you know, where the brain is housed. So anything that might be fearful uh, or might cause danger, um, you, you have this quick reaction, right? But then, you know, rationality kicks in and we do a double check and we can actually confirm, you know, the things that we're seeing. So we know that uh, the neurophysiological pathways make it impossible to take a decision without uh, memory. I'm sorry, without emotions. Um, but we also know that this link between the amygdala and frontal lobes, um, there's a really, really important role that's played there. And this was actually shown or displayed really graphically in the case of um, Phineas Gage. Gage was a railroad worker in the 1800s who, by accident, um, you know, had a tapping rod, this uh, a metal rod, go through um, through his his cheek and then out through his right frontal lobe. And before this accident, um, this fellow was, you know, a very congenial, very happy fellow, a leader. He was a decision maker. He um, he was totally transformed by this accident, which is what makes us realize basically that the connection, the normal connection that he might have had between double checking emotional content and then making decisions, something happened when this part of his frontal lobes was actually wiped out. So he was not able then to link this emotional um, feeling um, towards a, a decision making. So without the ability to feel any emotion, so two things happened to him. He couldn't express emotion. He couldn't interpret emotion in other people's faces, for example. He would look at them and they would, you know, all kinds of crazy faces and then what do you feel, what do you feel, what do you feel? And he had no way of identifying the emotional feelings or, or the emotional um, sensations that others were, were feeling. But he himself, they asked him, you know, how do you feel today? Well, okay, I guess, you know, he had no way of actually identifying his own emotions. So being unable to identify his own emotions and unable to identify emotions in others, this impeded uh, his ability to make any kind of decision whatsoever because all decision making hinges on emotional understanding. We know though that it's not just neural pathways that have an importance in, um, in making decisions. There's also neurotransmitters and, and there are, you know, dozens of them where by far, there's not just dopamine, neuroadrenaline, and serotonin. There's many other um, neurotransmitters in the brain that have an influence. And many people, you know, the sort of connect, you know, dopamine to, you know, the happy transmitter, neurotransmitter that's associated with good feelings. But we know that that's not limited to that. So there's a lot of, there's a huge scope there, which is really outside of my area of expertise. And I'm sure that um, um, Dr. Hudson can actually go into more detail about these things. But we know that the balance then between what would be normal neural pathways in the brain as well as the balance of correct neurotransmitters for different emotions are what influence um, new learning basically um, as well as um, our, our ability to make decisions and decision making is very much connected to new learning. Um, as you probably just saw in the, in the previous um, presentation by Kathy, there's a lot uh, connected with stress and stress hormones and stress hormones um, will impede the ability to make those connections in the brain so while there will be a normal link between information that would create those synapses that would create this pathway of new learning this plasticity in our brain to actually adapt to new things um, people kids under high stress situations certain neurotransmitters will impede the other neurotransmitters from doing their job so that it won't have these connections in the brain. So we know that um, both neural pathways as well as neurotransmitters play a role like as anything else but also in the function of emotions in the brain. All right? Um, so, sum up. Emotions are critical to decision making and there's no decision independent of how small or insignificant it might seem that is not influenced by emotions. Emotions always play a role. And we know that negative emotions and stress especially can impede new learning. <clears throat> so why in general, why would we say that emotions are important? They prepare us as we look at the root of the word again. They prepare us for our own actions. 
Based on our own understanding of emotions, we know how we should act, okay? So when we perceive the actions of others, we prepare ourselves to react to what that other person is doing. Um, and we act based on how we feel. You know, people do crazy things sometimes based on how they feel, their gut feelings, right? Um, we have psychologists, you know, who believe that emotions are a reaction uh, or reflection, sorry, a reflection of different feelings, okay? So how do we, you know, square that, that hole there, and that, that peg there, you know, round, um, round peg, square hole, square hole, round peg? <laughs> how do we join these ideas? And this is a really classic old, old um, concept in psychology. And to understand this better, I'm just going to, we're going to look at two basic theories of emotions um, and then look at a sub area of emotional intelligence to try to get our heads around this, okay? To do this, I'm going to stress you out a little. To do this, place these things in order. What is the order that these things occur? Do you feel? Do you have emotion? Do you perceive stimuli? What happens first, second, third? Okay. Got it? Okay. Now let's look at some theories to sort of answer that question and see if it, let's confirm our answers, all right? Um, the first theory we're going to look at is, is the canon bar theory of emotions, where basically the idea is that there's a perceived stimulus. You get something from the outside world, and that basically at the same time, or even separately in only one or only the other, you actually feel, you, you feel something, and you have a physical reaction to that. So the perceived stimulus causes your, you to have a, a physiological response to something, and that in turn it simultaneously can cause your feeling, okay? And then you react to that. So physiological changes and subjective feelings of an emotion response to a stimulus are separate and independent, okay? They're two different pathways. And the arousal doesn't have to um, occur before the emotion. It could, or it could occur uh, simultaneously. So there's not a, um, a sequence there. They can happen simultaneously. This is uh, different from the James Lang theory. Um, William James and Carl Lang um, believe that um, physiological changes will happen first, okay? You'll perceive something, then you will have this emotion, right? The emotion is your brain telling your body, you know, heartbeat faster or breathe quicker or here's a shot of adrenaline run, okay? And then you will have an experience uh, of a feeling. And I put feeling on top of emotion because the original theory didn't make a distinction like Damasio does between um, feelings and emotion, okay? So the idea here is a bit more linear, okay? You perceive a stimulus, you have a physical reaction, then you have a mental uh, qualification of what you are experiencing, okay? So there's a difference there in the order um, of experiences. So in general, in summary, Ken and Bard will say, and they both say, we get our information from the outside world, right? You perceive things. And Ken and Bard will say then, okay, at the same time, then you have a feeling and a physical response. Whereas James Lang will say that you have a physical response and then you're conscious of this feeling, okay? So James Lang is closer to Damasio's idea, right? That we are interpreting what our feelings are, um, or what, I'm sorry, what the emotion, the emotional physical sensation is in our bodies, um, into a type of a feeling. Now, I think, um, and, and you psychologists can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that this is a lot more um, connected or a lot closer to some of the ideas we've been looking at in class in the mind, brain, health, and education field about how to actually um, change uh, those things. If you're looking at Cannon Bard, it's basically, um, you know, stuff's going to happen, you're going to react, and that's it. In a James Lang scenario, let's uh, take, for example, um, uh, traumatic stress. Um, if you have a reaction, you have panic attacks to something. Um, the James Lang theory will basically say you are always going to have that increased heart rate. You are always going to have that sensation of running, that shot of adrenaline to your legs. You're going to have to get out of there. That's going to happen. That's going to happen, and that's the way things are. However, you don't need to feel that you need to run. You can now understand, you can become conscious. This is a big distinction between animals and human beings, right? You can now make a conscientious decision that when I feel that sensation of panic, I'm going to embrace it. I'm just going to accept it. That's the way things are, and I'm going to get over it, and I'm going to do something else. I'm going to react in a different way. I'm not going to run. I'm going to 
take a deep breath and be able to work through this. So basically this um, the James Lang theory is a bit closer to the way that we deal with a lot of um, you know therapies these days of how to help people get over um, certain things. It's saying you know we're not going to pretend that you will ever change what you're feeling that that feeling in your gut we're not going to be able to change that that's your brain's automated response to a situation that is in general it's to help you okay but when it starts to impede you it makes you freeze up makes you un, you know non-functional in the world that's when we can get over things and we can consciously um, conscientiously decide that we're going to get over that um, so anyways the tendency I, I would I would suggest would be more towards looking at this um, this other interpretation of how we can actually have the emotion but let our feeling be a new interpretation of that. Our mind then can dominate the brain. Basically that's the idea here. Okay? Okay, so now, given all that, going back to the same question we had then, according to the James Lang theory then, the conscious experience of the emotion, which would be that feeling, okay? What happens then? It, does it proceed, coincide, or follow physiological arousal? And the second part of this is, according to the Canon Bard theory, the conscious experience of emotion, or, or, or being, you know, understanding the feeling there, does that follow, or proceed, or coincide with the physiological arousal? And hopefully all of you are saying that it's definitely C, okay? You know the James Lang, there's that sequence, right? Whereas in Ken and Bard, these things were happening at the same time, okay? Okay, so now let's connect this idea to emotions and social cognition. Um, how many, first of all, how many emotions are there out there? How many do you think you can feel? Or are there basic emotions and sub-emotions? Well, we know there's tons of theories some of them are really pretty and color-coded and you know try to say there's some basic emotions and then there's uh, the way to mix all of those um, probably one of the uh, best uh, known or most well-regarded um, is, is um, Pluchik's um, um, models where he has more than 30 emotions kind of expressed here and he tried to put them into a continuum um, and and actually to also contrast emotions for example um, loathing would be the total opposite, according to him, if, if, as uh, admiration. If you admire someone and then you loathe someone, those are on you know absolute you know different ends of the spectrum. Or if you have ecstasy, that's the total opposite of feeling you know total grief and sadness, right? And then there's vigilance, where you're you know hypersensitive to to perceiving things or stimuli. And then there's amazement, where you're just sort of in, engrossed in, in a situation. So he's basically putting these on, um, trying to see if they can be contrasted. What I think is harder um, to justify is 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 um, are the wings. You know who's who's paired with what. Is ecstasy really? Does it have a, a a heightened sense of vigilance as well as admiration? I, I'm not sure. So. Um, and to make it even more complicated, you know, it put, sort of puts us on a 3D kind of level where they're all kind of mixing and matching. And so there's a lot of different um, 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 ways that you can interpret emotion. And there's a huge sub, 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 sub spectrum there. Um, basically, what ends up happening on the outside wheel then would be, you know, the, the, the actions, you know, how you would actually express this. Um, and so, anyway, so basically this is one of the more complex models and it might be um, even more helpful because if people can identify you know at what where are they feeling and where are they in a spectrum they can actually sort of um, then identify where they want to be okay so that's a, that's I guess a benefit of, of this particular model um, other models you know um, Takanishi tried to actually look at this as compared with consciousness as well so being uh, at a state of um, low consciousness or sleep to heightened, 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 um, you know, hyper alertness um, would be on another level. So basically, there's a lot of ways that you can sort of um, package this idea of, uh, of theories of emotions or, or where emotions come from. But Paul Ekman, back in the 70s, late 70s, sort of, um, he went down to the sort of, let's get down to a more simplistic model of this and understand that um, cross-culturally, he took these pictures, he took pictures of people's, you know, different people's faces 
and um, from from populations in the South Pacific to Americans to um, Africa, he tried to compare and asked people what emotions were they feeling. And what was fascinating is that um, there were only six universally perceived um, facial expressions of emotion. So while we might be able to make a lot more different faces, right, um, the, there's only basically um, six that, that everybody can understand. There was kind of a subdivision between contempt and disgust. So, you know, maybe there's seven here. I don't know, those of you who've seen um, Lie to Me or <laughs> this TV show. But basically, what did Ekman do? It was fascinating. He basically documented every single facial combination possible, you know, to you know, flared nostrils when you're angry to, you know, you know, raising your eyebrows when you're sort of like, oh my gosh, this again, you know. There's, he documented and tracked each of these and actually was able to show that he could teach other people to read other people's emotions based on, on, on looking at this. So, um, anyways, by, by clocking, uh, by, by documenting this, you know, uh, how how wide the pupils got, how big the eyes were, if the eyebrows were up, if the nose was, the nostril would flares, if the lips were pursed, you know, to be showing just angry, you know. Um, all of these things together were basically piecing together what would be, to him, basic uh, emotions, these six basic or six or seven basic emotions. And now with greater technology, there's actually some people who actually label this and call this a fusiform face area, this is very, very particular to human beings. Being able to interpret what a face, a facial expression is, is really, you know, very, very key. And, you know, some people say, you know, the eyes are the window of the soul or whatever it is. It's, it's actually true. You can actually see uh, in another human being um, their emotions. Now, why is this important? Because by understanding their emotions, you can sort of understand their motivations. You can understand what they're about to do. You can understand their following their subsequent actions. Sorry, this is in Spanish. Um, this is a, this in a parallel area um, in both sides. This is the bottom of a of a brain, right? There's um, the space that's uh, that's related to facial recognition. Okay, so basically the idea is if you can understand the emotions of others, you can then sort of preempt this idea. I know what's coming next. So emotions, as we talked about again, being able to actually get us to decide how to act or react, how to move, um, it's really key because then we can we can hone in on what the other person might be able to do. Now some things that are really kinda kinda worrisome that we've been able to, to track down, this is um, Patolo's work, is that we know that seven-month-olds um, pay more attention to fearful faces than to happy faces. So if I were to ask you why, and there's more studies, if you look at the literature, there are far more studies about fear um, than any other emotional state. Why would we study fear so much? Why would fear play such a great uh, role um, in, 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 human, in human contact, in human life? And basically, the bottom, bottom line answer would be that if we didn't know when to be fearful, when to run, when to get away from situations or threatening things, then we would, you know, lose a chance to preserve the body, and without the body there is no brain, and therefore, you know, that's the end of things. So the brain very, very, you know, selfishly wants to protect the body. So in almost any instance possible, fear is the e most easily elicited um, um, reaction. Um, fear, and then second most um, documented is anger, believe it or not. So anyways, a very, very interesting study. So if we know that um, little babies, and this is kind of, um, um, this is very much related to a concept, we haven't spent nearly enough time talking about this this uh, semester, but this idea that uh, of mirror neurons, which fire when a human uh, observes some somebody else doing something. So basically, is there a connection between mirror neuron systems and um, and the way that we react to, to things, or this whole circuitry of emotions in the brain. Well, there's no direct uh, connection that we can find. Basically, mirror neurons are, are, are more strongly documented in the olfactory bulb, I don't know why, and the hippocampus, not related to the amygdala. But basically, the idea is that mirror neurons fire when a, a human, when an individual sees another individual doing an action. So when we see that, um, it also, sparks what might be, and we don't know this for sure, 
the emotional reaction of that person. I don't know how many of you cry in the movies or, you know, get terrorized, you know, uh, and when you watch a specific kind of a film or something, you know, a horror film or something. But that's because we're watching somebody else experiencing something else. Those are our mirror neurons going wacko there, just basically lighting up and saying, okay, I can feel what that other person feels. Um, there's a lot of controversy around this because it's just so young. This is just a really young field. We don't know enough about it. We don't know enough about it in humans. Um, Again, we, you know, we talked about this idea that it could be related to things of self-awareness, uh, theory of mind, empathy, autism. A lot of these things are just not settled yet, so we really don't know. But it is uh, worth keeping this aspect in mind when we talk about how um, emotions, um, the circuits of emotions run uh, in our brain. So we know um, with young infants, before they even have language, you know, they communicate by reading faces, all right? And we know that it's, um, number one, we, we believed, we thought this was just so you can distinguish between mommy and the stranger, right? But now, it's not, now we know it's not just that. There's a lot more to it. It's more with emotions because that is the intent of the person. What is that person out to do? What are they, what are they going to do to me or, or for me or, you know, in my benefit or against me, right? And so we know that it, um, evidence uh, indicates that emotional processing, um, by facial interpretation is developed in utero, it is active at birth, as is the amygdala. We know that, for example, the hippocampus basically doesn't kick in and start working until around three and a half, four and a half years, which is why you don't have a conscientious memory of a lot of things. But we know that kids, sadly, you know, who might have been abused from, you know, early childhood, um, they might not, you know, first year of life, taken out of that abusive situation, put into a nice, happy family, that kid will not have a conscientious memory, will not, because his hippocampus wasn't working, but the amygdala is functional from birth, so he could have this traumatic emotional uh, connection and emotional memory there that could scar him for life. So we know that there's a lot of stuff happening here that relates to emotion and the housing of emotional memory, for example. And this develops really fast in human beings. Um, from two days, there's a big difference, to five months, seven months, human babies are able to actually develop this interpretation of the intention of others through emotions. Um, what's quite uh, disturbing to find out, um, because we know that facial expressions are a reflection of emotions, and emotions are an indicator of what that person is going to do next, their motivations, um, it's really sad, but well documented by Pollock and, uh, and, and company, that abused children respond in a disproportionate uh, way um, to angry faces. Angry faces just set them off. Um, because they know, and this is something that's known even by seven months of age, kids react to those facial expressions based on their past experience, um, with uh, the intent, what happens after they see that angry face, normally there's an angry action. And so those kids respond really quickly to that because they are fearful of what will occur after that. Okay, so adults is probably one of the, the, the most prominent uh, researchers in the area of so social cognition. And he's kind of tried to lay out uh, this whole, you know, schematic um, setting of how you go from um, understanding you receive the stimulus, right? And then how is that actually um, either simultaneously or very rapidly processed at a cognitive, emotional, and motivational level in so that we have actions that follow that. So those of you who are interested in this field, I would highly recommend that you take a look at, um, at Adolf's work. Okay, so in summary, um, what Ekman has ta uh, taught us about emotions, faces, voices, is that we know that the brain judges other people's faces and their tones of voice, it's a very different thing, but the tone of voice, um, almost unconsciously. It happens, you know, split second. So, but this can also be, this is very much colored, as we always say, um, by past experience. So as we saw by the seven-month-old babies who had been um, abused, they react disproportionately to angry faces because they're just conditioned to, to associate that face with that action. We know that an individual, I mean, we uh, individually have a whole, you know, set of baggage personally that influences how we react. So while this same, you know, mechanism happens for everybody, it happens differently.
for each person because uh, we know that everybody, for example, will react negatively to threatening situations. But what is threatening for me might not be the same thing as what's threatening for you. So we all have different triggers. So um, there's a highly personalized element that comes into this. But the bottom line is that um, we know, like in in a in a concrete um, example, is that in classroom settings. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've had students come to me and say, oh, my teacher hates me. <laughs> and I say, hi, do you hate the student? And they'll say, no, I have no, I don't hate the student. I don't even know who this person is. You know, what's the problem? Well, that student will have interpreted uh, what the teacher said, you know, or how the teacher looked at them. Oh, no, but he always looks at me funny or... You know, and the teacher will say, you know, I told her she's improving. He says, no, no, he didn't say I was improving. He said, you're improving, you know. And so the tone of voice um, matched with that facial expression. Um, that combination is, is very powerful, but it's also very personal. So different people are going to react to those things differently. So you might think that you are transmitting one message and other people are receiving a different message because of the way they're interpreting your, your face and your voice. Okay, so um, we're going to do two more things. The concept of emotional intelligence, which a lot of you are, are, are familiar with. As we said before, now just as a recap, so let's get the emotion part and then intelligence part. We know that emotion is then uh, the impulse that induces action. And we know this has an impact on a psychological level, right? How we feel about something on a physiological level, how our bodies react to that, and then in turn how we behave. Do we run or do we confront someone or do we uh, consider this a, a positive thing, okay? So that's emotion. And on the level of intelligence, again, I love roots of words, but intelligence basically means the one who knows how to choose. I think that's fascinating. So basically, um, how do we choose? How do we sort out good information from bad? How do we decide what to pay attention to, what is most uh, important? On another level, as we saw back in week three when we talked about um, cognitive development and intelligence, you know, definitions of intelligence, there are tons of them, but um, maybe two other categories of information. One would be, you know, the one who knows how to choose. The second thing would be certain abilities, right? Um, we can we usually associate this with problem solving skills or being able to anticipate situations and being able to um, to to plan. Okay, um, but the third point is that it's always connected to um, memory and um, as well as attention or ability to perceive things or pay attention to the right types of of stimuli. Okay, so if that's emotion and that's intelligence, then emotional intelligence then. Um, kind of quickly would be um, the ability to identify, assess, and control. That's one set of factors, right? Oneself and others. Now that's another pair of things. So given those two kind of blocks of things, you know, what you can do and then who you could do this to or with, um, if you've got that, if I were to ask you to graphically depict this, um, could you draw that for me right now? Could you make a take a second and try to draw? What do you think emotional intelligence looks like? If we know that it has to do with certain skill sets, as well as impacting certain people, what could that look like? One way to interpret this would be um, Marin Salavoy's um, um, interpretation that basically emotional intelligence has these you know four key things. One is managing emotions. Okay. Uh, one would be, in, I'm sorry, we have to go from the bottom up, sorry. So you can perceive, you know, the things that are going on around you. You perceive the things. You take in your world, right? Then you take that and you decide what that means to you. Is that a, a good feeling, a bad feeling, right? You understand this and then you are able to manage it. So that's one, and one of the most um, simpler models of an, uh, emotional intelligence would be based on that. What Goldman did is take those first four things and he added on two other things he said that once you are self-aware I know what I'm feeling self-regulate regulating I know how to then control myself oh yes I am feeling angry but I know how to control myself okay then you go out to the others right then you can develop social skills and not only that you can feel what the other feels you can have empathy for them okay once you have those four things, which are the same as, as what um, Meyer and Salovey were, were pointing out to us, then Goldman says, okay, and then from there, that motivates us. That moves us to do something else. 
um, that gives us an action, a plan of action, all right? And when we have that, then we can make better decisions, okay? So that's that's Goldman's theory of emotional intelligence in a, in a net hold. I mean, in a, sorry, in a, in a quickly re, uh, resumed um, format. We have other guys who go into emotional intelligence, you know, this is 2.0, this is the better version, and it's much more complex, but it's also very, um, it's very business model um, focused, but it's good. It's actually it's it's actually wonderful because it talks about you know emotional social functioning, general well being, right? Um, how do we act, perform? Um, again, I mean this is a well being model. It's it's focused on how do we find that balance in in emotions of others and ourselves, and uh, connected to the lecture you just had about stress, um, increase in this area helps you build up resiliency to certain emotions. You can feel um, this anger, you can feel this need to run, but you can also, once you have become aware of that, and this goes back to Ellen, um, Ellen Langer's um, presentation on mindfulness, mindfulness. <clears throat> once you can be more fully aware of what you are, you know, the, your emotional state, your body's emotional state, then your mind can then take over and sort of say, hey brain, okay, you're sending that signal, I don't want to feel that way, I want to feel some other way. And you can build up this, this higher resiliency um, to those challenges around you, uh, to emotionally challenging situations. So anyways, it, I think it's a fascinating concept that um, it's so healthy to be able to do this, to be able to recognize in yourself these emotions. But then um, you can also then, and it goes to the social cognition concept, remember Adolf's work, that you're able then to actually go into then the social room, society. And so now that I know myself better, I can know the other better. I can know myself better through the other. And there's a lot more, you know, harmony going on here. So basically we can find this balance based on having a, a, um, a stronger sense of emotional intelligence. So this would be a more modern view here. Um, the more simplistic view, remember when I said, can you order these different concepts? This is a KISS model. Uh, the keep it simple, stupid model uh, of emotional intelligence is basically saying that there, there's the, the actors, right? There's myself and there's the other, okay? The first thing I have to be able to do is I need to understand it. I need to recognize, you know, certain emotions. And then I need to be able to manage it, okay? Regulate it, okay? So once I can do that, this would be the more simple uh, pattern here to, uh, from going to self-awareness if I'm self-aware then, then I can manage myself. And then if I'm socially aware, then I can actually manage my relationships with others, okay? Um, this leads to sort of a competencies framework. You know, if I were to then sort of take each of those blocks of understanding and sort of try to, um, to break it down into its smaller parts of self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, social skills, um, I can, this is a, a great structure because it basically says within my own personal management, I have to work on these things. And actually, I can't manage others until I can manage myself. So basically, there's these stages then of um, emotional development and development of emotional competencies that we can work through. Um, and we know that there are some things that, uh, that are actually just sort of um, gut reaction things, involuntary reaction. And then there's things that are more deliberate. And then there are things that are kind of shallow types of reactions, you know, being jealous of somebody else. And then there's deep ways of, of, um, of reacting to certain things. So um, there's a great uh, map on the University of Rhode Island, um, a kind of a mind map that says, you know, here's our external triggers, here's our external stimuli. This is how our body is reacting to this. And then based on our feeling, how our mind is, we can control our behavior, all right? And this happens on an individual level as well as on an a interpersonal level with the other, with the people outside of our, our realm, okay? So can we measure this? Obviously, um, there are some people, and sorry to say this, um, those of you who have engineering backgrounds, there is really no good, you know, you can't sort of devise an algorithm, okay, I feel this way, so it's an if and then scenario. If I, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, this is not how emotions work. It is, you know, the brain is messy. So it's not like there's this really um, simplistic concept that, you know, these are the pathways of apology and this is the pathways of fear. Um, well, this might have a, a basic attraction to it because maybe a lot of people do react this way. 
Um, we know that it is just far more complex than that. There's just so many other pieces of the brain involved that it's not just an if-then scenario of how we decide to react to the other. Uh, we know that the same people can be faced with, uh, with similar stimuli and they're going to react differently. Why would um, somebody have, you know, a certain trigger or a lower threshold um, um, uh, um, to, of resilience towards, towards a certain um, situation than others? We know that all of our past experience helps us build up to that. And I guess the point of this particular class has a great deal to do with um, how do we get to that balance? How do we get to the state of wellness where we can actually um, react in the most appropriate ways? Um, to the situations around us in the most uh, in, in the best way possible right for example in the um, course room somebody mentioned I think it was area that there's this terrible experience with this awful um, dentist who and she was using this as in terms of mindfulness but this was a person who was watching TV while they were cleaning this uh, the person's teeth now this shows a total you know lack of emotional intelligence because this person had no understanding of the other right um didn't understand that maybe some people might find you know getting your teeth cleaned uncomfortable or or worrisome or whatever um and they had no connection with the other person this shows a very low level of emotional intelligence and a low level of being able to understand in a socially cognitive way how to interact with your world so we know that um Emotions will play a very key role in actually our, our, our good integration into society. Um, again, to show the complexity of things, you know, there's a big ping pong that goes on between, you know, frontal lobe, amygdala, frontal lobe, amygdala, when, during fear processing. Um, Rulamiere is also a wonderful author in this area of emotions and emotional mechanisms in the brain. A lot of terrific studies um, that he's done. Um, also, there's more specific um, studies related to emotions. For example, social anxiety disorder, um, and that's even more complex. You know, the, the things that are going on in the brain. So, this simplistic model that Buman was showing beforehand of you know, if this happens, then this happens, and you feel this way. I would just sort of reject those things. Those are just way too simplistic. Depending on the individual and the individual's reaction to those situations and those those emotions. Um, in the past, um, they're going to react differently, and they're going to have different thresholds for resiliency towards different situations. So we have to be much more personalized in, in our interpretation of emotional processing in the brain. Okay, um, there exist a ton of tests uh, if you want to test, you know, emotional intelligence, um, but they all basically break it down into to measuring, you know, four key things. Uh, things related to empathy, um, utilization or management of feelings, uh, handling of relationships with the other, and also controlling oneself. Um, so it basically goes back to the same uh, points that um, that uh, Meyer and Salovey were, were, were pointing to. If you like, there is um, the more sophisticated model I was mentioning to you, the, the Baron model. Um, and there's a three-part video that's available online that you can actually watch that are short summaries of basically what these tests actually measure, okay? Um, I, one that I absolutely love is the marshmallow test. Why the marshmallow test? Um, the marshmallow test is basically a test of delayed gratification, um, which happens to be an incredibly important indicator of future uh, emotional intelligence. So we're going to take a, a quick look at this video. Um, hang on just a second. Okay, sit in that chair. Alright, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you another one, so then you'll have to. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right. something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Uh, it
It's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm going to leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. <laughs> How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. Okay. <laughs> okay, so basically, um, that's a great indicator because it has to do a lot to do with self-control, right? And so basically, um, this is actually a very good indicator looking at longitudinal studies that actually shows that de delaying gratification is actually a good first indicator. These are kids who are three and four years old um, to how they actually are able to... Um, uh, respond and and their levels of emotional intelligence as adult, adults which is actually fascinating so okay so basically um, if we're trying to cultivate emotional intelligence in children what will we actually do what could each of us do you know starting today and uh, there's three really key things one is appropriate vocabulary um, the other is helping kids understand um, cause and effect you know action and emotion and to develop empathy so for example if a kid um, you know, gets, you know, really angry, and you can respond to him, you can say, you know, I understand that you are feeling mad, okay, identification, this is the, this is the word for what's going on inside of you, okay, I understand you're feeling mad because Susie took the ball from you, okay, so basically, you're feeling mad because, what caused that, okay, but hitting isn't the solution, okay? That was the result. That was the end result. You felt bad, you hit somebody. That's not the right result. So if you can make that link, okay, first identify the emotion, and then you can make the cause and effect. What caused you to do what you did, okay? That feeling of anger made you hit her, all right? So if you can do that, that's a huge leap. More sophisticated is then to say, you know, but how would you feel, you know, if you were hit? So trying to get them to put themselves in the other kid's shoes. Now we know this is really difficult. It takes a lot of time, habituation, good practice there, but but that's something we can do with all kids all the time. We know it's unfortunate that kids who don't develop this this sense, um, more or less around the age of eight, it's almost like, you know, it is so hard. It's not impossible. An adult can learn to be more uh, emotionally intelligent, but it's a lot harder. Why? Because we just know, you know, all these habituated skills or reactions or mental steps that a person can take, um, if they're developed earlier in life, we know that there's just, you know, it, it's uh, it ends up being um, an easier start for, for people. So helping young kids do this is really important, actually, and helping adults who still can't do this is also very important. Okay? Um, just three more slides here. One is has to do with alexemia, which is... Um, there is such a condition as people who don't have words for emotion. Now that is kind of cool, isn't it? And so Peter um, Sivneos uh, actually came up with this when he was diagnosing patients who they, they were, there was an inability in their, in, in their vocabulary to describe emotional structures. Now what was the end result of that is that if you can't, if you don't have those words, there is a sense of frustration, 
you cannot express um, symbolic emotion, uh, which leads to an inability to have emotion, uh, I'm sorry, imagination, and you have a poor fantasy life. I mean, so basically words are important um, in this link between emotions um, and being able to understand yourself without, and this is why it's so important for little kids, right? Helping little guys develop that vocabulary that's so important to being able to understand themselves. What is going on inside of me? What is this emotion? How does that make me feel? And how is that influencing my actions? Those things are, are hugely important. Um, the one last thing that um, that uh, I might ask you to do is reflect on, you know, what are other ways that you might cultivate um, a better self of self-understanding of emotions and, and those of others. Um, I'll just throw out one idea that's kind of out there, but is I, I, I really firmly believe in this because um, Alan Hobson, I had the pleasure of taking a class with him at Harvard on um, sleep, but he has a theory that dreams uh, are necessary not only for the consolidation of memory and other things that his student um, Robert Stickgold showed, but also dreams which tend to be you know so out there you wonder you know what is this connected to he says the role of dreams is to practice emotions it's to help us know how to react in real life when we're awake okay and in a more conscious state so what's interesting is other people valley and his colleagues have shown that um dreams actually in general are much more negative than real life which might you know lend credibility to what hobson is saying that we have to practice for all these you know, difficult things that we might face in real life, so let's practice them uh, in our dream states. Um, and Kutz mentions an emotional selection hypothesis that um, he says that dreams help us um, change our mental schema. So they help us confirm the way we already do things, and they help us entertain alternate ways of thinking about things. Okay, so I just leave you with that, you know, kind of big question there. Um, and with one just last one, one quote, you know, a man who is a master of himself can end sorrow as easily as he can invent pleasure. If I know what this emotion is triggering in me, I can decide what to feel. Okay? I don't want to be at the mercy of my emotions. I want to use them, to enjoy them, and to dominate them. I think Oscar Wilde had something great to teach us there. Okay, so with that, we end, and thank you very much for your attention.